tell you now is the demo that we did in order to send it to producers and to send it to uh, licensing, uh, licensing catalogs to see whether or not we could get uh, like a bite or an interest. I'm only going to show you about, uh, <coughs> excuse me, I'm only going to show you about 20 minutes of it. It's like 32 minutes long and there are maybe about four <coughs> songs that you're going to hear. Please don't. Yes, you did. Yeah. <laughs> okay. I don't have my glasses. The musical. This is an audio demo of the musical Satin Dog. Book and lyrics by Anne E. Eskridge and music by Alton J. Satin Dog is a black Pygmalion. A backup singer for a rapper is willing to change for fame, and a black conservative talk show host vows to help her change for him to win a coveted sponsor. Our story begins in the city. Well, everyone is on the hustle. Malika, one man, like Beyonce and Cher, has just had an argument with her ex-boyfriend and boss, rapper LaFree. He fires her from his booty group, but she vows to become famous without him. In the meantime, she has to eat, so she sells odds and ends on the street like everyone else. At the same time, there are Edward Hollingsworth, a black conservative talk show host, and his liberal co-host, Robert Joyner. They spend the good part of an evening trying to convince Mrs. Harris of Harris Funeral Home and her daughter, Dina, that their show, The Middle Passage, is the kind of show for a niche audience like hers, where the motto is, let our home be your home for all eternity. <laughs> but Mrs. Harris says that The Middle Passage is, well, dull. She says she'll listen to them when they have a better idea and then leave. So, two people who need a different direction accidentally find each other. Tell me what the future
Joyner goes Hollingsworth into turning his street urchin into a lady. Take it at the reality show. Middle passage to middle class and win the approval of a sponsor, Joyner says. Hollingsworth is thinking Malika's uncouth and loud. Malika's thinking Hollingsworth's a screaming prick. Both are thinking, hmm, here's my chance. And the transformation begins. Hollingsworth is teaching her how to properly speak, but Malika feels he's insulting her at a ten job interview, and she explodes. Next, Hollingsworth has to deal with the former boyfriend, LaFreak, when he tries to seduce Malika. <laughs> I should also say we have lots and lots of donuts. Grab one now, grab one for the road. And um, also both Isaac and Molly have books for sale up here for, for after the reading. So um, now I have the pleasure of introducing poet Isaac Piquel. 
Isaac Pickell is a poet, PhD candidate, and adjunct instructor in Detroit, and a graduate of Miami University's Master of Fine Arts program in creative writing. He is the author of two books of poetry, Everything Saved Will Be Last, from Black Lawrence Press, and the forthcoming It's Not Over Once You Figure It Out, from Black Ocean, which is out November 6th or 7th. Yeah. Okay. Um, and his recent work can be found in journals such as Brevity, Copper Nickel, Fence, Passages North, and Poetry Daily. Isaac's taken a seat in all 50 states and has so much work to look forward to. Or so much to look forward to, but maybe that includes work. more work, yeah. Well. Um, <laughs> so yes, I I'm not finished yet. <laughs> uh, Isaac is not new to Detroit, but he is new to Detroit Mercy, and I'm very glad he's here. As I often say when I meet another poet, it's always good to know another poet. <laughs> um, but what's even better is when that's a wonderfully talented poet. Isaac's work is a new discovery for me, um, and I'm thrilled to have found its bounty. There are many things I admire about Isaac's poetry. One of these is his ability to examine and render the self with such candor, and how he does so in the spirit of the question rather than the answer. I do often tell my students it's not so much what you write about, but more so how you write about it. And reading Isaac's work, I'm also struck by this sort of philosophical grammar at work in his poems this kind of logic that's even more pleasurable to follow because of his formal mastery of language. I find especially his use of line breaks and the poetic line as units of meaning and space. So I'm excited to hear this work off the page. Now, please welcome Isaac Pickel. on the table. Thank you for that wonderful introduction, Stacy. That was so kind. Um, I'm glad you found my work, too. And uh, um, I feel uh, honored to be here. Uh, I'm going to read this chunk of poems. They're all basically brand new. Uh, so bear with me if I stumble over anything. I'll try not to. Um, there's kind of three movements. Uh, one is, um, I guess, philosophical. The next uh, is about family, and the last is about death. Uh, we'll end on a high note. We love doing that. Um, so uh, I guess without further ado, I'm going to open my water bottle so that I'm ready if I get thirsty. And uh, I'm going to read some poems. We demand options that taste like movement. We gale like quietness hums an all-embracing swell into the stale air until all other noise is a verb in the past tense. We din against what is until your ears ring. We chorus wind, ripple in the space between the letters of the word change. We sound, clang and knell, blouting out a bargain that only promised us the ground where we already stand because we demand options that taste like movement. You can see they hear us. We broke their rhythm, schemes like tripping on the double dutch rope. Syncopation gone feral, we strike. And they can't just wait for all, us to, all of us to go hungry, can they? The great fear is that they wait us out until the clock chimes status quo on our empty cabinets and cupboards, until we grow tired of being followed by death like a feral cat we fed once in winter, until we go tender without sleep fist around an amulet just strong enough to keep our hands warm until there's nowhere left to set our feet. We weigh choices that sound like never, that hear like nowhere. We stand together with nothing, and yet, and yet we stand. We gale, we sound, we ferment in their cup and they grow drunk on clout. We taste bitter in their mouths and when they open to spit, we make space for each other, hold their throat hostage. We are their throat. We always were. We hold tight. We wait for better options. We demand space between the letters of the word change. Thank you. 
one two step for the end of history. The neck is a hardy metonym for every pressure point they have us in, but we have so much body and they only have two boots, so shake a little bit. Rattle every bone you've got and roll a little bit. Do the worm like it's still in style. Wriggle out from under their steel toe and crack a smile. Spin your hips and stomp your feet until you feel something start to shake for you. You do not have to clap for that one. Couplets for poets who make rent. Some things will survive like the memory of that time we maxed out all our credit cards. Funding a righteous war we named righteous because it was good for business. The interest kicking in only after the missiles were already overhead. Zloom is the sound missiles might make if we could hear them, but they are very far away right up until the point they reach you. The fires will spread and we will gather to watch the fall, rejoicing without knowing why we cheer. People who were not there will tell you they remember the rattle and the still of the explosions, the whoosh of air lost forever. But there will be no time to worry about the atmosphere or who was right and who was wrong, because most everyone will be wrong, and that would take a lot of time. Instead, the future tense ceases to exist, because the banks do not exist to tell you who you will be, and the buses all run on time. And everyone has everything they need waiting for them in their pockets, and everyone has pockets. People meet each other for brunch underneath the canopy of crumpled institutions, but do not call it brunch because there is no money, and brunch was always a class marker and not a mealtime. We invent new names for old things that no longer have meaning, like sunspotting for life insurance, or torpor head for landlord, or normalcy for gender-affirming care. Academia decomposes into an open access playground, and we all forget what it meant to be ABD, replaced in our heads by acronyms that carry less dread. Wordings are replaced by flowers, Social media is replaced by bowling alleys that never close. Race is replaced by nothing at all. People lose track of their pasts and begin to begin again. There is nothing left to want and nowhere left to go. But people still cry because it feels good sometimes. Some things are poems. Some things are rocks. Some things are scissors. Some things are blank sheets of hammer mill, bright white inkjet paper. Some things are copy and pasted between six job aggregation websites. Some things are dead main streets with lights on at the di dialysis clinic. Some things are parrot feathers springing forth from an otherwise obstructed throat. Some things are spontaneous, uproarious applause. Some things are magic, really magic. Some things are the senator's quavering lip. Some things are the senator's steady hand. Some things are petrified wood. Some things are their own metaphors. Some things are black Sambo dolls on sale at your father's bookstore. Some things are free tours at the plantation in Natchez that are led with a smile. Some things are victims of a past that's already bitten down and locked its jaws. Some things are hoping to qualify for Medicaid until you can qualify for Medicare. Some things are splitting the bill. No, actually, let's just put it on a payment plan. Some things are extending the life of the shampoo bottle by adding water. Some things are love growing wild in the cracks of the details of the day. Some things are sharing the dew that collects in the cups of leaves. Some things are an early crocus encased in glass after an ice storm. Some things are raised bed vegetable gardens that taste better than anything from the grocery store. Some things are ecologically sustainable grasses growing through the parking lot of an abandoned strip mall. Some things are premium gasoline. Some things are gas stations that accept EBT. Some things are Amazon gift cards in lieu of payment. Some things are what you can buy but never hold. Some things are the drugs you take to stay alive. Some things are swallowing luminosities. Some things are the breaking points of intimacy. Some things are old stories that pass too slowly. Some things are your mother's bunions, which rasp like home. Some things are the pinch in your smallest toes from shoes that almost fit. Some things are your dog's eyes when she remembers the smell of the vet. Some things are not going to take it anymore. Some things are calls to action we're ready to follow. Some things are careless manifestations of the first person plural. Some things are the man, always the man with the perfect politics. Some things are not worth the shout they're spoken in. Some things are not worth the ink they're printed in. Some things are kettled but not silent. Some things are the fleeting screech of a cop's riot shield against the linoleum floor at the end of a shift. Some things are the quiet streets of 2023. 
Some things are still worth waiting for. Some things are not poems, even though we want them to be. Some things are just the moon when it's not quite full, but you call it full anyway. Some things are the word ontology. Some things are deeper than measurement. Some things are loving your worn and ragged hands. Some things are pulls from the same bottle passed around again and again and again. Some things are the uncanny gleam of a freshly cleaned ashtray. Some things are make-believe. Some things are extravagances for you and necessities for them. Some things are poems. Some things are memories trapped on the soft palate. Some things are the quiet gurgle of the regurgitation of empire. Some things are the motley secrets only our bodies can keep. Some things are a fledgling bird still wobbly on its feet. Some things are not the end of the world. Some things are over before you know it. Some things are not poems, but we can teach them to be. Okay, don't get fired, Isaac. <clears throat> we talk about the future while we're living it. You dream of slow, slow mornings that aren't yours. A milky espresso instead of a coffee, a date on your plate, a little view of the city that isn't the city, but for that it's perfect. Just windows and cramped back decks in every direction. A view of other people's views. The patchwork site of shared space. We have two layers of privacy bushes busying our backyard. On a walk, we found an ornate picture frame on the side of the road, and you asked me to take your picture through it. A romantic view of view. A glimpse into the pace you might take on life if it wasn't this life, if work didn't begin at 7 a.m. It feels like we haven't seen each other in days, our schedules training us for rushed goodbyes and sex with the lights out. Back when we were defined by nothing but graduate school, we talked about real jobs like they were the finish line and not this gust of a 100 students that swept over us, consuming our lives in the flash of a jackrabbit's eyes. That's the thing. There isn't an academic jobs crisis there's a compensation crisis. So we have to work past the sleep in our eyes to be paid what we are worth, like the thousands of part-time jobs we have learned to call gigs because they compensate so unseriously. So we talk about the future and the end of contingent labor, the beginning of living at an affordable rate, teaching just a couple classes at an art school and writing in your spare time, biking wherever you need to go, parenting at the speed of sanity, fucking in front of the window because we don't have to be ashamed of our hurry. You dream of slow, slow mornings. You dream of who money could make us. Some things are left unsaid. You were once told that Palestine was never and nowhere, yet it exists in your mind as the open air prison that's closing in on five million people. You pat yourself on the back for this construction and pick a fight with your in-laws and use the word, word apartheid several times. You think you have done something. You try to remember Palestinians do not need your imagination or your arguments to be real. You try to evoke just how real they are, like restaurant owners who know the name of every regular or bicycle riders arriving right on time just before sunset. You start to say they are just like us, but choke on the word. You cannot tell if your throat's caught on the Jew of you or the American, but you know they are nothing like Americans. You let this guilt drive you instead of justice, and so you never know what to say without centering yourself, and here you are doing it again. You try your hand at metaphor, but olive trees feel awkward in your mouth and you do not know the Arabic word for butterfly. You look it up, say farasha out loud, say farasha again. You do not look up the Arabic word for silence. It's a real fucked up time to be black and Jewish. All my relatives on both sides who remember us marching together are dead or dying like all my ancestors on both sides have always been dead or dying like all my cousins on both sides listened to Kanye back when he used to say the right things for attention, like how George Bush doesn't care about black people or how Taylor Swift doesn't deserve anything. But now my in-laws have schwarze on the tips of their tongue and my cousins are posting Kyrie's face on Facebook and everyone 
on both sides keeps finding new ways to say they don't feel safe around those people, but I am those people. Like how my parents' synagogue hired me to lead a social justice reading group back when George Floyd was murdered, since I could bring communities together because I was the one black Jew in the congregation whose face they knew would never scare away the donors. But now everyone only wants to talk about anti-Semitism. And now they ask me why we're reading about them when they might want us dead. And now all my poems are starting to sound like apologetics. And maybe you already know that I've always had trouble with plural pronouns anyways, but now the only thing holding my us together is that maybe sometimes the enemy can still look like a friend, like maybe you already know it's all the same people that want all of me dead. All right, now we're gonna talk about death and dying. Yay, there you go. Poem in which I'm avoiding visiting my mother in the hospital. Someday my mother will die, and with her will wither my tether to home, the part of me that knows just what it is, that can see itself in the mirror, even in the dark. But what to do with an incomprehensible fact? Some things are only possible after they can't be true. I've been brooding all morning, shouting at Twitter because no one there can really help, ignoring the one person who keeps asking what she can do. But silence is past, just like noise does. I try breaking it with my palms first before my words, with my eyes and the underside of my knee and the softness of my two soft arms and the way you can listen loudly. I break it like a worm seeing with its whole body. While I try to go comfortable with the responsibility of caring for someone who is caring for you, my mother just waits. She's really counting on this visit, since her point of reference is always eternity, like every call could be the last one. And today is her birthday, her 74th. And she's got, as she's gotten older, there's been this evolution in her thinking, where she feels more comfortable when she's reaching back into history, even if it never held her far enough so she can remember how hard every present can be, like this hard present doesn't have to be remarkable. When I went to be there with, when I want, while I want to be there with her, I lack the bravery of welcoming hurt or of telling the truth, which is really the same thing, telling her, mom, I'm also afraid that you are going to die. See how silly that looks, there all by itself, like it can't be real. They just get sadder from there. Imperfection and other promises. My dad woke up pale and shaky on the hospital bed and asked me whether the dreams are even his anymore or if he's just watching them. All I can do is gesture and answer. It's still a week before they'll know what's wrong. His is the viscous pragmatism of a mind on diagnostics, medicated beyond every extant symptom spun up tight and twirling against the relief of its own stories. The landscape of his body, the soft leather of his skin has changed so much since those days when I learned faces through closed eyes, palms grasping at his ears, settling on his cheekbones. He's porous now, thin and treacly, having absorbed the decades I spent remembering him as sturdy, eyes closed to the way he soaked up time, my dad hasn't stopped dreaming, and I worry over how much he dwells on the mistake of believing in them for so long. But have you ever seen someone invincible? He'd sing this song to me about fathers and sons, and he'd cry every time as if he'd never done it before and was just learning how. Big, opulent tears. The kind you get when you know nothing can hurt you, and then something does. He was my hero then. He couldn't do no wrong. He was the wisest and the strongest and the best of men. Now that he's sick, now that he's sick, I've been thinking a lot. I think about my dad, wishing long bowels were a little more literal so words like home could stretch out into the speaker's contentment until they turned real. I know I'm not home enough, 
letting an hour's drive hang like a euphemism for the things we've said, for the distance between us. Whenever I do visit, he tulips into song. He knows it's easier to come back that way, no matter what. Every time I used to make a mistake, he'd tell me a person isn't a single picture, and now I worry that all those years I spent refusing to let him age, I refuse to let him grow, too. Like we're still fighting the same fight I started the night I learned he could be wrong, shuddering from his touch and relentless familiarity, like a daylily that wouldn't close with the sun. I hadn't learned the sumptuous clutter of over metaphor or the way we both keep everything we've ever touched on tables and shelves if we can't keep it inside. I still don't like to think about the way the years run away from the people we love, faster than we can freeze them with things, how little time it takes. Now that he's sick, I'll have to start practicing how to tell you the man my father was, the kind who talks about birdsong and flowers even if he doesn't know how to grow them, who is always softer than the leather of his skin, the kind who wants to live forever, who named his only kid after a sacrifice that wasn't. I had to learn for myself that children are our only real glimpse of mortality before we meet it, facing how fast the years run and the things they steal. I know it's a bit too convenient of a frame, but now that he's sick, when I'm the parent, I cry sometimes like I've never done it before, and I'm just learning how. How little time it takes, how everybody breaks. It's his heart, again, and some kind of infection. Sometimes I try to sing to my kid even though I can't play the piano, and nothing's ever quite the same. And only when he rolls his eyes do I remember how much I used to hate that song and the way he cried, because I didn't understand yet how everybody breaks, how sometimes we're wrong about what's a mistake. I got two short ones left. I think I'm on time. <clears throat> Nature poem. My stepson's favorite teacher's real son killed himself with a note just last week. And I still spend more time watching the family of chipmunks who've made a home out of what's left of my yard than I do thinking about anything that could still be called an America worth living for. I live for intentional calamities of beauty, like the unknowable morning when every tree decides to change its clothes in unison to show off their mastery of temporary death. But my stepson's favorite teacher's real son said he died because the world is ending forgetting that if it's kept secret, you're endless, alive and scattered across a million pieces of everyone else's sensation. Like how sometimes, when I'm alone, even I forget how much I love the smell of the ocean. Of all the poems we wish did not exist, most of the adults had gone, leaving a menagerie of first cars lined up and down the cemetery drive, beaters and hand-me-downs parked at odd angles with two tires on the grass, waiting and waiting. They gathered about the grave site, unable to move, trading hugs back and forth until you'd think that currency of comfort had lost all its value, but they kept on hugging, even the ones you could tell were socially anxious, who looked lost in the crowd until arms found them. Mine was one of those tears hiding behind the transition lenses as he lumbered between embraces. There shouldn't have to be a poem titled On Burying Children, but there is, and there is, and there is, present like the indelible sorrow of watching teenagers shovel dirt on tomorrow. No, not tomorrow. That's just a metonym. The kids did not bury a concept or a time. They made two lines some with heads bowed and others eyes up, taking turns and turns and turns, grabbing one of the six shovels and dropping earth between them and their friend. Once Simon was completely covered, the grave diggers collected their shovels and drove the heavy machinery back to wherever it rests. The rabbi told everyone to remember the flashes of joy, but those feel fleeting in the moment of precipice. So they lingered and lingered and looked around unsure of how to finish this poem.
Thank you very much. That was, uh, it blew us away. Um, I, I, one of the great things about having Molly as a colleague is that you can always uh, catch her with a question and get a completely nonsensical answer in response. So today I said, I'm going to introduce you tonight. What would be one thing I should emphasize? And so Molly said, say that she was born as a very young child. <laughs> I'm giving you what I've got. I'm sorry. It's what I've got. It's what, this was my, what my research gave me. Um, I want to emphasize uh, sh one short story collection uh, called Little Black Dots and just out, uh, Dancing on the Via Della Rosa. And uh, Molly has been a lot of great journals and has done uh, terrific work in fiction and is a uh, much appreciated and very devoted teacher. And we're really lucky, lucky to have her. So, Molly Bob. Everyone says I'm Dorothy. I was working the desk one day, getting caught up on some paperwork when a guy came into the shop. Even down in Midtown Detroit, where my shop is, far enough away from the suburbs and the residential districts that it's a destination and not a convenience. People come in all the time just to look around. The phone rang a few seconds later, murder city costumes, costumes to die for. And by the time I finished with the call, he was at the board. We have a, a date board where singles who want to meet somebody or just need someone to go to a costume party with put up a name and a phone number and hope someone responds in time. It seems unwise, but we haven't gotten any response reports of abuse, and the people that use it say it's better than trying to find someone or something online. He was staring at it pretty hard. Either the writing was small or bad, or his eyesight was terrible. I went over to find out which. Can I help you? No, just browsing, thanks, the guy said without taking his eyes off the board. Are these people for real? As far as I know, why? He pointed at one in the middle of the board. Chick wants a date for a party in a couple of days. Wants him to dress up like a winged monkey, makeup job and all. How weird is that? The man shook his head and laughed a little, and a minute later left the store. I didn't watch him go. I had the door sensor to tell me he'd gone, and the card had drawn my attention. It sounded like an intriguing proposition. The woman, apparently named Irene, that was who the card said to call, <coughs> needed a date for a Halloween party. She would be going as the Wicked Witch of the West, and wanted a companion to be, quite understandably, a winged monkey. <laughs> What I suspect the other guy had laughed at was a line on the card, stage makeup required. <laughs> it sounded fun. A few friends had asked if I wanted to come to their party, but the thought of going to them didn't appeal to me the way this one did. I knew picking a card off the board was fundamentally a bad idea. It was my shop after all, and trolling for dates here seemed ill-considered, but the proposition intrigued me. I took the card down, and instead of calling from the shop's phone, I used my cell. Irene picked up on the third ring. I saw your request card in Murder City Costumes. I had a question about something you wrote. Yeah? She sounded apprehensive. A bit about stage makeup. You need to look and act exactly like one of the winged monkeys from the movie. <laughs> makeup is part of it. Arrangements are on me, but everything is at my discretion. <laughs> ah, I see, I said to buy myself time. We had a couple of those costumes in stock that were faithful to the movie, and being made up didn't bother me if that was involved. Are you still looking for a date to that party? Accompaniment. Yes. I'm interested. She had left a few things off the card. <laughs> in the interest of space, she said. On the one hand, that was fair enough. The card in question was half of an index card, and had she put all the things she listed off on there, the print would have been so small as to be illegible. On the other hand, now I said yes, it was starting to seem like a job. We were to meet a few hours before the party at the offices of a makeup artist she knew over on West Grand. 
That person would take care of both of us. I want to make sure the job is done right, she said. I don't want my wing monkey to look half-assed. <laughs> After that, we would go one floor up in the same building to a photographer's studio and have our pictures taken. When that was done, we'd go direct to the party out in far-flung Livonia. I suggest you eat beforehand, she said. I want you by my side at all times during the party. You're an accessory for my costume, after all. Can you act like a wing monkey? I was starting to feel taken advantage of. In the two days between the original phone call and the party, I'd had more than enough time for misgivings. Before I pulled the phone, before I pulled the card down and called, the whole proposition sounded like fun. I'd done sillier things before for Halloween, like the year I went to a party dressed as a Christmas tree and had people keep watering my feet. <laughs> what Irene was after didn't seem like a Halloween costume as much as it did performance art, or perhaps an out-and-out -out audition. Twice I nearly dialed her to say I was backing out, but pride and integrity stopped me. I said I'd do it, no point in backing out now. I turned up at the appointed day and time at the building on West Grand where the makeup and photography were to be done. The place had seen better days, but then, so at the building my costume shop is in. The building directory had the makeup artist on the first floor and the photographer above that. There was a private investigator on the third floor. I filed that away in the event something happened. <laughs> when I presented myself at the makeup artist suite, Irene had already been there for the better part of an hour. I wasn't let into the room where she was being made up, something about wanting to save the big reveal until later. I sighed and went into the bathroom to put on the winged monkey costume. There's a lot of costume requests come in that are movie related. They, those usually sell out first, those and the pimp and prostitute ones. I came out minus the wings. Those would be put on at arrival at the party to avoid being crushed in the car. And sat in the makeup chair facing the mirror. The man who would be working on me introduced himself as Charles. I'm the assistant manager, he said. Alan's working on the witch. He's the manager, I take it? I said. Yep, been running this place for 20 years. Man knows what he's doing. Anyway, your girlfriend is very insistent. Not my girlfriend, more of a blind date thing. Well, Charles said, putting the furry skull cap on me that was the exact same shade of gray as the monkey outfit. Whatever she is, she's pushy as all get out. Wants just this and just that. Brought a copy of the movie and wanted Alan to watch it for reference before he started. <laughs> they settled on keeping a stole of the witch on the TV he's got in there. I mean, seriously, who hasn't seen that movie 20 times? By now, everybody knows what the friggin' wicked witch looks like. Could be she's getting into character. Maybe. I've heard stranger things, although I, I bet she'd be easier to deal with if she played to her strengths. I wanted to blink in surprise, but he was applying epoxy to my forehead just then. I don't follow. Oh, that's right, blind date. Well, fella, take off all the makeup on your lady friend in there, and you'll find out that Margaret Hamilton looks a hell of a lot more like Judy Garland. <laughs> I sat still for the next hour or so while Charles carried on with the makeup. The skull cap had to be glued on, as did a prosthetic lower half of my face, so a healthy chunk of time was spent waiting on the glue to dry. He tried to hurry this along by using a blow dryer on it, and while that helped, after a few minutes I got tired of hearing the damn thing whirring in my ear and feeling the dry heat on my face. Somewhere in the middle I closed my eyes and tried to find my happy place. When I opened them a few minutes later, a pair of brown eyes staring at me were staring at me from a mottled green face. Hi there, Irene said. I'm Irene. Shane, I said, offering up a hand. She took it. Her hands were green too, from fingertips to just below the elbow. My pleasure. She stepped back for a moment and stood upright. It was odd, seeing the Wicked Witch of the West standing there in a dressing gown, the green fading to rosy flesh at points that the costume would hide. Her black hair, which was probably a wig, was pulled back into a bun, giving the whole thing the appearance of being a businesswoman who'd just gotten out of bed. Or, given the skin tone, was in the middle of a spa treatment. I didn't know this until later, but the only thing really wrong with her was the height. She was a little shorter than I, and at six foot one, that made her well taller than the person she was trying to be. You look good, she gestured up and down me. 
the costume. Thanks. You can do the monkey acting? I think so. Irene nodded and turned to leave. See you in a bit. I watched her go. If she looked like Judy Garland, I couldn't see it. Then she had enough makeup and prosthetics on by that point, she could have looked like Nixon underneath it all, and no one would have known. <laughs> Perhaps not Nixon, though his jowls could have been hidden. A little more than an hour later, and the makeup was done. Charles told me he'd take some scrubbing to get it off, and my skin would be raw for a few hours afterwards. But hey, you have alcohol to help you with that, right? And Miss Garland. Irene was done right after I was. She came out of the other makeup room in costume. It was almost impossible to tell her from the original. The closeness was so striking, I was too impressed to speak. She took my silence for approval. Upstairs, my pretty. She even had the voice down. The photographer is waiting. The photo shoot went about as well as I thought it would. The combination of all the makeup and the costume with the bright lights made me feel like I was on the verge of overheating for most of it. I did my best to play the weak monkey, hunched over and looking as subservient and afraid as best I could. Irene didn't say much during the shoot either. Most of it was simple responses like, okay, and like this, to the photographer's instructions. She was the main focus of the shoot, as she should have been. But as much to showcase the makeup job as anything else, probably at the request of the guys downstairs. He had me stand for a few shots of my own. Ordinarily, I wouldn't have. I enjoy having my picture taken as much as I enjoy a Novocaine free root canal. But as I didn't look much like myself at the moment, I went along with it. Irene used the opportunity to step into the ladies' room. You two an item? The photographer said when she was out of earshot. Just met her today. I looked menacing and he clicked a few times. Pity. Listening to a voice like that every day would be nice. I stood up straight. One of my vertebrae cracked. How'd you mean? Listen. I watch The Wizard of Oz every year on TV just like everyone else. I know almost every line. When she called by the end of the phone call, I was hoping she'd break into somewhere over the rainbow. She came, she came back into the room just then, and we both let it drop. We took my car out to the party. It would mean bringing her all the way back into the city afterwards, but I didn't mind. I had a little apartment above the shop. Somebody had to live in downtown Detroit after all, and just then, it was my turn. <laughs> Irene handed me a slip of paper with the address on and had me program it into my GPS, then promptly took a nap. I left the radio off and thought about her voice. She hadn't put on an affectation yet, so far as I know, except for the one time. So what I'd heard to that point was her real voice. I tried to match it to what I knew of Judy Garland's, but I couldn't draw an honest comparison. It had been too long since I'd seen any of her movies. Nobody recognized me at the party, but I hadn't expected them to. I didn't know anybody there, uh, and I didn't recognize any of the costumes as coming from my shop. Nobody recognized Irene either, and I think that was the point. We were greeted by the host and hostess who were wearing pirate and serving lunch outfits and were nearly told we weren't allowed in. Irene cackled. I think you'll find differently, she said, pulling the invitation card from an inside pocket. The hostess eyeballed the card and said, Who be ye then? Or did ye plunder this from one of our guests' pockets? I growled. <laughs> it felt like it fit the part. And Irene put a hand on my shoulder and said something into the hostess's ear, whose eyes widened. There was a brief whispered consult before the host said, No kidding, Irene? She nodded. Please, the hostess said, go right in. Good costume. Very funny, we didn't recognize you. I'll get you for this, my pretties, Irene said. A Cairn Terrier wearing an eye patch and a tiny Hawaiian shirt ran up just then and nipped at our heels. And you little dog, too. <laughs> we mingled. The first half hour or so was a bit uncomfortable, as nobody knew who was under the makeup, and Irene wasn't breaking character. Most of it was kept to small talk. Very small talk. Once word spread via the hostess about who was under the green face paint and fake nose, people started opening up more. Well, to Irene, anyway. I was still just the wing monkey, the plus one of the arrangement expendable. She sent me off for drinks a couple of times, and people did try and talk to me then. 
I got in a few mentions to the costume shop, gave out some business cards I had hidden on my person, because that's what a small business owner does. One of the times I was sent for drinks, I found Irene on the back patio, alone, staring up at the sky. It was an unseasonably warm October from Michigan. The temperature that day had just scraped 70. I handed her one of the drinks, she thanked me, and we stood in quiet contemplation for a few moments. It isn't fair, you know, she said after a sip of her drink. What isn't? How somebody gets known for one thing and one thing only. I mean, you have a career, a life, vast, diverse, and for better or worse, out of all of your works, you're known for just the one thing. I pondered the railing we were leaning against, such as, she waved an arm up and down herself. Margaret Hamilton appeared in a bunch of movies, did a lot of work on Broadway, and what do people remember her for? Melton. <laughs> she would do personal appearances years later, schools and charity events and whatnot. And people asked her to say a couple of lines in the, in the voice. She took it as a compliment, but at the same time, it went unrecognized that there was so much more to her than the Wicked Witch of the West. Or take that guy. She gestured through the window at a man in a white jumpsuit dotted with gold buttons. <clears throat> Look at him. He's Elvis. Always will be. Now, he could drop 50 or 60 pounds, lose the jumpsuit, put on a leather jacket, shave the sideburns, and be 68 comeback Elvis, and not Vegas self-caricature Elvis. Either way, he's still Elvis, because he looks like the man, and he feels like he doesn't have a choice. Know what he does for a living? <clears throat> I shrugged. Elvis impersonator. Everyone expected him to be. I thought for a very long moment before I said anything. Does that explain your costume tonight? Irene turned her head toward me, but before she could say anything, some of our fellow guests joined us on the patio and we resumed our roles. We were moved back inside the house. Apparently the host and hostess liked the people to stay inside and there were now enough party goers in the house that further conversation with Irene would have had to have been shouted. The drive back to her car was as quiet as the one to the party. She napped again and I wondered if she'd be safe to drive or if she'd fall asleep at the wheel. I didn't mind her sleeping though. I wanted answers, but I was also enjoying the quiet after the loud party. When I got back to the building on West Grand, I pulled into the parking space next to her car and nudged Irene awake as gently as I could. She yawned and stretched and looked around. We're back at your car, I said. Oh, she said. Well, thank you for going to the party with me. My pleasure. I paused while she unfastened her seatbelt and recovered her big black hat from the back seat. Listen, I said, about the costume. She looked at me evenly. Pretend you could be somebody else, anybody else, even if only for a little while. Would you do it? I turned that one over for a second. I don't know. Irene nodded opened the passenger door and got out. Before she closed the door, she leaned down and said, your costume is really good, you, you do good work. She shut it then, and a minute later, her car was pulling back onto West Grand. It escaped my attention until I got home, but she left the broomstick in my trunk. In fairness, it was a couple of days before I noticed it was there. I generally don't look in my trunk unless I need to and another day or so before I figured out how in hell a broomstick got back there. In the end, it was the photographer emailing over the photo shoot results and seeing the broomstick in them that tipped me off. After allowing my picture to be used as advertising for both the photographer and the makeup artist, in exchange for advertising my costume shop, I was able to get her last name and confirm her phone number from both of them. If that hadn't worked out, I was prepared to call that private investigator. She was, I think, surprised to hear from me. I'm surprised to hear from you, she said after a moment of pause. I didn't think you particularly cared for the other night. No, I, I liked it fine, I said. It was just all in costume. I don't know that I really got to meet the real you. The pause from her end was long enough to screen a few movies. I should have made it clear up front. I wasn't really looking for anything romantic. No, I, I completely understand. 
I wasn't either, although romance between a green witch and a furry gray monkey would have been an optimistic idea bordering on foolish. I've been single long enough to know to keep my options open, though. <laughs> but you left your broomstick in my car. I heard her sigh. That's what I figured. I wouldn't mind bringing it out to you, you know, keep the outfit completely together. It isn't necessary, really. But it's, it's part of the costume, and it'd be a shame. It sounded way, even to me. So I tried to salvage it. And, you know, costumer sensibilities? There was another long pause before she said fine and told me to get a pen to write her address down. 45 minutes later, I was pulling into an apartment complex in Southfield. Hers was a third floor walk up. I got winded climbing the stairs up to it. It took her a minute to answer when I knocked. Who is it? She said through the door. I looked, stunned. There was no spy hole for her to look through. Broom delivery, I said. It sounded like two bolts got drawn before the door opened. I walked into her apartment and went three steps before I realized I hadn't seen her yet. She had hidden behind the door as I entered. The door snapped shut and she drew both a bolt and a chain latch. Safety an issue around here? I said, trying to keep a light tone in my voice. Irene turned around then. She had her hair up in a towel and her face had no makeup. The few freckles she had, had stood out like anything. No, she said, but I lived in Brooklyn for a few years. Old habits die hard. I'd taken the time to watch the movie. The voice was so close as to be indistinguishable from Garland's. I could feel myself getting dumbstruck. To give myself cover, I called out the broom. She smiled and took it. Thanks, she said. I didn't know what to do next. This wasn't my place. Had it been, I would have offered me a seat. Please, she said, gesturing, sit down. Would you like a drink? Water would be fine. Irene sat in the room against the wall and walked into her kitchen. A moment later, she reappeared with a glass of water. I took it, sipped, and put it on the coffee table in front of me as Irene sat on the other end of the couch. She looked sad. I enjoyed the other night, I said. Really? Well, everything except the hour or so in the makeup chair could have done without that. She nodded. I wanted everything to be complete. I'm not complaining. It just, it, it got to be a bit dull. He had some music going, but it was more for him than me. My man talk radio on. I don't keep up with the news. I was completely lost. The talk could have gotten smaller. We hadn't yet bridged the weather. I decided to get my big question out in the open. Kind of. I guess, I said, then stopped. The sad look on her face got a little sadder. I know why you wanted to come out. I have a pretty good idea if someone told you something about me when I wasn't around. I nodded. She sighed and cursed. Even that night, they couldn't leave me alone. I guess I understand the costume, I said, why you would want one. She stopped making eye contact then. Instead, she focused on the glass of water. What I don't understand is why that one, the Wicked Witch of the West. Irene took a long inhale and exhale. Could you excuse me for a moment? She stood up without waiting for an answer and went into the other room, what must have been her bedroom. I sat on the sofa and looked out the window at the tree outside which had already lost all its leaves. About 10 minutes later, she came out ruby red shoes with a hint of sparkle, blue and white check dress, white undershirt with sleeves that stopped just above the elbow, slight blush, lipstick, hair, her real hair I think, pulled into pigtails. She hadn't given herself time to braid it. The only thing that was missing was the picnic basket. I wanted to say something like good lord but thought better of it. I felt transported back to the movie, only this Dorothy wasn't on the other side of the screen. She was right here, in front of me. No transition from monochrome to technicolor necessary. She was right. This was why I'd come out. I could have kept the broom. I started hearing it in middle school. 
the comparisons. I was a blonde up until then. It seemed like one night I went to bed a blonde and woke up a brunette. And that's when people started calling me Dorothy or Judy. Every fall, my new teachers would take roll call and they'd get to me, read off my name, look at me, and go, really, your name is Irene? The other kids would laugh and all they'd want to do was hide. My voice settling into a contralto, her contralto, didn't help. It hasn't changed much now I'm older, except people are more discreet about it, or they think they are. Nobody says it to my face, but I've heard it at work. People talking when they think I'm out of earshot. And I get invited to this party. The, the, the hostess, the, the pirate lunch, works in HR. And she said to me, we want to see you looking like you walked off the set of The Wizard of Oz. <laughs> really? Said it to my face. Didn't say which character. But the implication was hard to miss. I shifted a little in my seat. It didn't seem like she was done yet. I'm just sick of it. Every day, day in, day out, I may as well look like Elvis, like that guy at the party. At least he can make a living doing that. There's no call for a Judy Garland impersonator, which really stinks. Because I know they're right. They're all right. Everyone, everyone says I'm Dorothy Gale. For one night, I got the chance to be somebody else. Was that so wrong? It was getting on in the day. Outside, the sun was starting to go down. There was one good answer, and I knew it. No. Irene looked at me and smiled. No. That's my time. Thank you very much.